Uh, okay, I think the case of Finland is quite interesting, but um, we are, for, for example, in our organization, in this moment, we are very much settled here in Latin America, and especially in Colombia. You may realize there is a big difference in the cultural backgrounds of individuals, and therefore, there are very uh, different and very asymmetric interests, goals, uh, the way in which people rationalize problems and try to tackle okay. these problems in this context, in this, in this very asymmetric context, how maybe the cultural backgrounds of individuals may affect or better off maybe in the, in the, in the, in the, in the future this collective intelligence you are mentioning in the, for the case of Finland. Can you please elaborate a bit more your ideas on this topic? Yeah, so it's an excellent question. I think it's exactly the, the sort of frontier of the research right now. Um, because in a way, looking at Finland or Iceland, actually, uh, it's looking at the best case scenario, right? We, you have like sort of small homogeneous population. I mean, in the case of Iceland, there are like 300,000 people. It's, it's, you know, the, the, the size of the uh, smaller than the smallest state in the U.S. Uh, in the case of Finland, you have about 5 million people. It's also relatively small. Sure. And those populations are extremely homogeneous uh, uh, in terms of you know, background, uh, cultural and, and, and social and moral values. Um, so that certainly is a best case scenario. So if those things didn't work there, for sure, they, it's unlikely they would work anywhere. Luckily, they seem to be working. I mean, uh, there is here a question that remains. Do you think this inclusiveness of the process uh, can be always a constant since sometimes societies are looking for the better decisions and some people, for example, attack the idea of democracy beyond representativeness because maybe uh, they don't believe in the criteria or uh, uh, the interests of uh, the average population and in this approach they believe they are able uh, by representative democracy uh, to, to reach better decisions in society. It is possible maybe to, to, to compare or to analyze whether if inclusiveness uh, allow societies to reach better decisions as a collective uh, entity? So I think I, I, I kind of disagree a little bit with the premise of your question, which is that you can only achieve inclusiveness through direct democracy, which I, that, I think that's what you sort of mean. And I don't think that's true. I think you can have representative institutions that are inclusive. The problem is the only one we're aware of or we're familiar with are representative institutions that are based on election and those are not particularly inclusive actually. So I think that's why I want to develop that concept of post-representative democracy because I think the concept of representation is, doesn't need to be tethered to that idea of election. If you untether it from that, then you can develop a concept of representative democracy that is truly inclusive. Um, through, for example, selection mechanisms like uh, lotteries. Uh, so, so I don't, I don't want to give up representative democracy just yet. I, I want to perhaps qualify or even give up representative government, which is the model we have, and which is profoundly unsatisfactory and, and definitely not inclusive enough. That said, I'm also really interested in the way in ways to include direct democratic. Um, uh, the, the, a direct democracy components to that new model of, of post-representative democracy because I think that sometimes indeed uh, the, the better way to gather the, the sort of uh, knowledge that's um, you know in distant uh, parts of, of, of the citizenry uh, is to just open up the, the door to citizens right so I do think there's something specific to, um, to direct democracy um, uh, experiments like participatory budgeting in Brazil, like crowdsourcing, the experiment uh, that they've been conducted in a lot of countries, including Brazil, but also Finland. Uh, uh, those those are, are really useful. Um, there's a danger associated with them, which is, which is uh, that of pure self-selection, meaning that only the highly motivated partisans or the people who have a lot of time on their hands are going to show up. And that creates uh, a certain, uh, a certain bias in the kind of interest and views that are uh, that are uh, conveyed in the you know and, and included in the process. So you get more inclusiveness, but it's an inclusiveness that in a way excludes other or crowds out other views. So that's why I think it's, it's better to think of, of democracy as a sort of as a system or at a systemic level in which direct democracy. Um, sub-elements 
are included to make the, the process more inclusive globally, but are not the only way to, 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 to make decisions or make the law. So that's how I, I would answer your question. Uh, some people say uh, representative democracy was an historical out outcome of the uh, shift that uh, the older uh, social structures embrace to reach some kind of social participation. Therefore, at that time, uh, there was a particular technology of information, which was the print and also aristocracies were uh, highly qualified uh, elites compared to yes. the average population. Today, yes, we uh, have been exploring how, for example, uh, technology is uh, changing, uh, technology is the dominant, uh, and, the, and, and also uh, societies have uh, developed a different cultural background and an average individual today in a low income or medium income country has already a lot of cognitive constructions. Information media today part of a highly organized and coordinated society. Do you think these demographical and technological shifts maybe are telling us that democracy should be something more than the way in which we experience this concept from almost 200 years? Absolutely. I, I couldn't agree more. I think, you know, no, I, I don't want to sort of criticize representative government, the old model, too much because it, it performed a very valid function for a while. I mean, in the 18th century, as you said, it was a way to, it was, a, it was an old way to crowdsource policy making already, right? At least you were expanding the, the, the pool of decision makers to okay, uh, essentially male, uh, wealthy uh, aristocrats, but um, it was still better than having just one king and, and, a, few, you know, and a few oligarchs. So it was a progress, um, but it's a 200-year-old model, so it's very dated and it's kind of broken at this point. And uh, so just voting every four years for a representative and, you know, um, having very little say in, uh, in how that, that representative behaves and, and having an, an opportunity to give feedback that is very, very um, limited, I don't think this is enough anymore. I think citizens have grown used in their private life to be able to give feedback on, on a lot of things uh, through new technologies. So those things should definitely be incorporated in the new model of government. And also technologies that allowed uh, um, not just a two-way street night, a multilateral kind of dialogue uh, between the representatives and the citizens, but also the citizens um, themselves, uh, you know, the various sort of civil association and, and communities can enter into dialogue through Twitter, Facebook, um, even across, in, and our, our discussion is an example of that, even across national boundaries and cultural, uh, you know, barriers. So. Um, another, I think, another thing that happened um, is, is probably the, the move from the, the age of the, of, of the TV, you know, or the radio or the TV. Every time there was a new technology, I think democracy changed a little. So, um, uh, the, 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 the thing is, the radio and, and, and the TV only allowed a very passive sort of um, uh, democracy where people could only watch. It's, it's, all, it's already something. They could watch the leader, they could assess their performance. Uh, and, and clearly, the, the, when, you, when you move from audio only to uh, visual as well, from, from video as well, you move from one type of politician, you know, the Nixon type, to, to another type, the Kennedy type, the much more charismatic, uh, telegenic type. But now with the internet, you need another type of politician. Uh, you need someone who's able to, to, to engage the public, who's able to respond, who, who doesn't behave as a as a, as a sort of a elitist guarded, uh, uh, you know, professional who wants to maintain the the, the constituencies at bay, they they have to be much more, in a way, they have to be much more like the constituencies, um, I think. So I agree with you. The model has has to change. It has to evolve.